Summary Overview, Chapter 4, Faith and Understanding, Section 1, Paragraphs 1 to 25. Mahakashyapa narrates a parable to further illustrate his understanding of the Buddha's teaching. In short, faith and understanding in the Buddha's teachings are critical in the journey of attaining Buddhahood. Parable of the Father and His Lost Son The son of a wealthy father ran away from his home about fifty years ago. Throughout the years, the son became increasingly impoverished. One day, the father spots his son by chance and immediately takes actions to guide his son back to him. His son, being humble in outlook, is terrified of the dignity and affluence of his father. He perceives that the type of work available in the grand mansion might be too difficult for him as he has limited skills and ability. When he tries to escape, his father devises an expedient method to make working in his mansion more appealing to his son, by getting his son to work as an excrement remover. His son immediately accepts the job offer. To get closer to his son, his father transforms his outer appearance by wearing grubby clothes and speaking in a churlish manner. As the years pass, the son slowly develops confidence in his ability. Subsequently, his father gives him greater responsibility by putting him in charge of the management of the storehouses. Eventually, when his son's capacity and outlook are fully developed, his father reveals the truth of the father and son relationship between them. He also bequeaths his entire wealth and inheritance to his son, who accepts the unexpected fortune with great joy. Key Messages the Buddha is the wealthy father who understands that his disciples, being humble, are fond of the inferior teachings instead of seeking the highest way. As such, the Buddha applies the expedient methods to develop the capacities of his disciples so that they are ready to practice the Buddha way. In essence, there is only one Buddha vehicle but the Buddha has taught it in three different ways due to the varying capacities of his disciples at a given time. At that time, when the four noble and wise monks, Subhuti, Mahakatyayana, Mahakashyapa, and Mahamadgalyana, heard about the unprecedented Dharma from the Buddha and the prediction by the Bhagavath about Shariputra's future attainment of supreme perfect enlightenment, they conceived an aspiration for enlightenment in their minds. Exuberantly delighted, they arose from their seats at once, straightened their robes, bared their right shoulders, knelt on their right knees on the ground, and pressed their palms together with a focused mind. After bowing respectfully, they gazed up at the dignified countenance of the Buddha and said, As the leading monks, we are already old and worn out. We thought that we had already achieved nirvana, hence we did not seek to attain supreme, perfect enlightenment. The Bhagavath has been expounding the Dharma for a long time. All this while we have been sitting at our places with our worn-out bodies, meditating only of emptiness, formlessness, and non-action. Hence, neither the Dharma of Bodhisattva, the enjoyment of divine powers, the pure Buddha lands, nor the salvation of living beings appealed to us. Why is this so? Because the Bhagavath has enabled us to escape the threefold world so as to attain the actual proof of nirvana. Besides, we are in our twilight years. When we heard of the supreme perfect enlightenment as taught by the Buddha for the transformation of bodhisattvas, we neither feel joy nor do we aspire to pursue the goal. Today, when we hear the prediction from the Buddha himself that shravakas can attain supreme perfect enlightenment, we are exhilarated at gaining an unprecedented experience. We consider ourselves deeply fortunate to hear the exceptional Dharma because we have received great benefits and an abundance of precious treasures without actively seeking them. O Bhagavath! We are delighted to use a parable to illustrate our meaning. Suppose there was a young man who deserted his father to live in another land for ten, twenty, or even fifty years. The older he was, the poorer he became. He wandered everywhere in search of clothing and food until one day, he happened to head toward the direction of his native land. His father had been searching in vain for his son. Eventually, he settled in one of the cities. Exceptionally affluent and wealthy, the storehouses of his father were overflowing with immeasurable amounts of gold, silver, lapis lazuli, corals, ambers, crystals, and pearls. He also had many servants, subordinates, clerks, and attendants, not to mention the innumerable elephants, horses, carriages, cows, and sheep. Moreover, 
he also owned plenty of profitable businesses, properties, and investments across many lands. His business dealings with merchants, investors, and customers were thriving and prosperous. Meanwhile, the impoverished son, wandering town after town and passing through land after land, finally arrived at the city where his father had lived. His father always longed for his son. Although he and his son had been separated for fifty years, he had remained tight-lipped about this. With a remorseful heart full of regrets, he thought, I am old and worn out but I own great fortune such as gold, silver, and an abundance of other precious treasures overflowing in my storehouses. It is a pity that my son is not with me. If I were to pass on one day, my wealth, assets, and treasures would be scattered and lost because there is no one to whom I can entrust my wealth. Hence, he missed his son dearly, thinking repeatedly, if only I could reunite with my son and bequeath my entire wealth to him, I would be supremely relieved and delighted with no more worries. O oh Bhagavath! In the meantime, the poor son took on one odd job after another until he finally arrived at his father's mansion by chance. Standing by the side of the door, he caught sight of his father at a distance. With legs rested on the jeweled ottoman, his father was seated on a lion throne. There were Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and citizens surrounding him with reverence. His body was gloriously adorned with strings of natural pearls worth thousands of millions in value. Servants stood in attendance on both sides of him, holding white fly whisks. A jeweled canopy with hanging banners printed with flowery images was used to shield and protect him. Fragrance was sprinkled over the ground and clusters of top-grade flowers were scattered all over. There were also a plethora of precious items in rows for business transactions. In view of such splendid adornment, his father exuded the presence of dignity, majesty, and eminence. Having seen how majestic and powerful his father was, the poor son was terrified. Regretting coming to the place, he secretly pondered, this person must be a king or someone of high authority, definitely not a place for me to earn a living. With my limited ability, it is easier for me to get food and clothing in some shanty towns. If I were to stay here any longer, I might be seized, oppressed, or even forced into labor. With that in mind, he fled in a haste. Meanwhile, the wealthy elder, sitting on the lion throne, was overjoyed at spotting his son immediately. He thought, finally I have someone to bequeath my enormous storehouses of wealth and fortune to. I have always been thinking of my son but have had no opportunity of meeting him. Now he suddenly appears by himself, this is what I have been wishing for. As much as I am old, I still yearn for him. At once, he ordered his men to chase after and bring back his son. Soon, the men swiftly ran after his son and managed to seize him. Horrified, the poor son bellowed furiously, I have done no wrong. Why are you capturing me? Instead, the men continued to grab hold of him even more strongly, compelling him to follow them back. A sudden flash of thought came over the poor soon, I have committed no offense and yet I am being taken as a prisoner. Oh no! There is no way I could escape and surely I am going to die. Gripped by great terror, he passed out on the ground. His father, having seen this from afar, instructed his men, I have no need of this man. Do not force him to come. Just pour some water on his face to bring senses back to him. After that, say nothing more to him. Why? Because his father knew that his son, being humble in aspiration and outlook, was unable to accept the wealth and eminence of his father. However, his father knew beyond any doubt that this was his son. Hence, by using an expedient method, he did not reveal to anyone the true identity of his son at that moment. The men said to the son, We are releasing you now. You are free to go anywhere you wish. The poor son was so relieved and thrilled at this unexpected turn of events. He picked himself up and went straight to the shanty towns in search of food and clothing. Meanwhile, the wealthy elder, hoping to coerce his son back, decided to use the strategy of the expedient methods. He secretly dispatched two men of haggard and undignified disposition to follow his son, 
giving the instruction, approach the poor fellow and gently tell him that there is a place where he will be paid double his current wage. Ask him whether he is keen. If he agrees, bring him back to work. If he asks what sort of work he will be doing, just say that he will be responsible for removing excrement and that both of you will be working with him. The two went in search of his son. When they found him, they told him as they had been instructed. Thereafter, his poor son received his first pay before following the two for the excrement removal job. When the father caught a glimpse of his son, he was overwhelmed with sympathy and remorsefulness. One day, he peered through the window at a distance and spotted his son. Emaciated and haggard, his son was mired with excrement, grime, and other filth. At once, the father removed his necklaces, fine garments, and personal ornaments before putting on soiled and grubby clothes. He smeared grime on his body and used his right hand to carry a tool used for removing excrement. In a churlish and crude manner, he hollered, work hard and don't be lazy. By using this expedient method, he was able to get near his son. Then he continued speaking to his son, saying, young man, if you continue working here, I will increase your pay. Do not worry about basic necessities such as cooking utensils, rice, flour, salt, vinegar, and so forth. I have an old servant, too. If you need him, I will assign him for you. So relax and take it easy. You see, I'm like a father to you, aren't I? So don't worry. I am already old but you are still young and strong. I notice that while you have been working here, you have not been deceitful, lazy, hot-tempered, or resentful. I have never seen you misbehaving, unlike the rest of the other workers. So from today onward, I shall treat you like my own son. Shortly after, the wealthy elder bestowed a new name to his son, as he would do to his own child. At that moment, delighted as he was with such treatment, the poor son still considered himself a humble person. Therefore, his father let him continue removing excrement for the next twenty years. As the years passed, both of them developed confidence and mutual trust. The poor son was able to enter and leave the house freely, without any difficulty. Nonetheless, he remained living in the same old place as before. O oh Bhagavath! One day, the wealthy elder succumbed to illnesses and he knew his days were numbered. So he spoke to his poor son, Now, I have a bounty of gold, silver, and many other rare and precious treasures in my storehouses. I want you to manage the inflow and outflow of the goods. Such is my intention and I hope you understand. This is because from now on, you and I are one and the same. Devote more attention and care in the discharge of your duties, making sure there are no mistakes whatsoever. Thereafter, the poor son obeyed the instructions and took over the management of all precious goods, gold, silver, and rare and valuable treasures in the various storehouses, without the expectation of receiving even a single meal in return. He remained living in the same old place as before without relinquishing his humble outlook and his sense of inferiority. After some time had passed, the father perceived that his son, having gradually developed self-confidence and benevolence, was ready to accomplish a great aspiration. His son started to feel ashamed of his former low self-esteem. Realizing that his end was fast approaching, the wealthy elder ordered his son to meet his relatives, the king, ministers, ksatriyas, and ordinary citizens. When they had gathered at the assembly, he made the pronouncement, Gentlemen, I hereby announce that this person is my son, my son of direct lineage. He abandoned me and fled to another town, wandering for over fifty years and suffering many hardships as a result. His original name was such and such and my name is such and such. During that time, when I was still living in my former town, I worried about my son, searching high and low for him. After some time, I happened to stumble into him by chance. He is truly my son, and I am, in truth, his father. Whatever that belongs to me, all my wealth and fortune, will now belong to my son. My son has already inherited the full knowledge of all matters with regard to the inflow and outflow of goods. O oh Bhagavath! When the poor son heard the words of his natural father, 
he was elated at gaining something unprecedented. He thought, I had no intention of seeking those things and yet, the treasure storehouses flowed to me unsought. O oh Bhagavath! This wealthy elder with all his riches and opulence is none other than Tathagata and we are all the heirs of the Buddha. Tathagata has always taught that we are his children. O oh Bhagavath! Deluded and ignorant, we obsessively attach to the inferior teachings, thereby having to suffer the three types of agonies in the midst of birth and death. Today, the Bhagavath leads us to consider abandoning the filth of discussions with regard to the inferior teachings. In the past, we diligently advanced the practice until we reached nirvana, which was like the wage for a single day. Having attained nirvana, our hearts were blossoming with joy, thinking that this was sufficient. We said to ourselves, we have received a great deal of blessings and benefits as a result of our diligent practice. However, the Bhagavath, knowing from the past that we had the tendency to attach to unworthy desires and delighted only in the inferior doctrines, just let us be instead of trying to explain to us by saying, all of you shall have a portion of the treasures in the storehouses, namely the wisdom of Tathagata. The Bhagavath used the power of expedient methods to expound the wisdom of Tathagata. We misconstrued attaining nirvana, which is equivalent to one day's wage, as a great gain from the Buddha, hence we did not aspire for the great vehicle. Moreover, we reckoned that the Buddha wisdom was expounded for the sake of bodhisattvas, instead of shravakas, hence we did not conceive the aspiration to attain it. Because the Buddha understood our delights in the inferior doctrines, he applied the power of expedient methods to expound the Dharma for us. As such, we did not know that we, in truth, are the children of the Buddha. As for the Buddha wisdom, the Bhagavath has never been parsimonious as we are actually the children of the Buddha since time without beginning. However, because we were fond of the inferior teachings, the Buddha did not immediately teach us the great vehicle. Should we have had a loftier aspiration in seeking the great Dharma, the Buddha would have long expounded the teaching of the great vehicle for us. Now, the Buddha has finally revealed the one vehicle in this sutra. In the past, the Buddha chided Shravakas, who were delighted in the inferior doctrines, in the presence of the Bodhisattvas. In truth, the Buddha was indirectly using the great vehicle to teach and guide us. Hence, we use the parable to express our message, although we initially did not aspire to seek such a great Dharma, the great treasure of the king of Dharma has come to us unsought. This is something the children of the Buddha deserve and we have already received it. Thereupon, Mahakashyapa, wishing to reiterate his meaning, proclaimed in stanzas. Summary Overview, Chapter 4, Faith and Understanding, Section 2, Paragraphs 1-64 Mahakashyapa speaks in poetic stanzas to summarize the parable. Today, we hear the teaching. From the Buddha Voice our hearts are singing with joy. At gaining something unprecedented. The Buddha said that Shravakas would become Buddhas. The unsurpassed clusters of treasure troves has finally come to us unsought. We were like a child, young and ignorant, who abandoned his father and ran to a faraway land, wandering from one country to another. For a span of around fifty years, his father, worried about his son, went in search of him everywhere. Exhausted from searching in vain, he stopped by a town and built a grand mansion, a place where the enjoyment of the five desires abound. His family was exceptionally wealthy. He owned an abundance of gold, silver, seashells, agates, pearls, and lapis lazuli, and elephants, horses, lambs, oxen, palanquins, carts, carriages, properties, maids, and servants, as well as a great population of citizens. He also owned profitable business investments that had been expanded to many other countries. Merchants, traders, and business owners could be seen doing business everywhere. There were thousands of millions of billions of people surrounding the king to give exaltation. Always a king. He was adored by many officials and nobility. 
who came together to extol him. For some reason, people were attracted to him. Such was his massive affluence, and his mighty power and influence. But as he aged and was debilitated, his worry and longing for his son was aggravated. Day and night, he ruminated. My days are numbered. But my ignorant son has deserted me. For over fifty years. But what shall I do with? My storehouses full of treasures. At that time. The poor son was scouring for food and clothing. From city to city. And country to country. At times, he got something. At times, he got absolutely nothing. Starving and scrawny. His body was afflicted with sores and scabies. Wandering around, he eventually arrived at his father's city, changing from one odd job to another. He reached the mansion of his father. At that moment, the wealthy elder was seated on a lion throne, within the gates of his mansion, shielded by a great canopy, surrounded by his relatives and dependents. Numerous guards and attendants. Some of them were doing calculations. Of gold, silver, and other precious items. The inflow and outflow of the treasures. Were recorded in the accounting system. The poor son saw his father. Eminent and dignified in demeanor. Thinking that he must be a king. Or the equivalent of an emperor. Frightened and intimidated, he blamed himself thereafter. Why on earth am I here? Secretly, he pondered. If I were to stay any longer, I might be captured and put to forced labor. Having thought as such, he ran off immediately in search of a poor hamlet so as to get work more easily. Meanwhile, the wealthy elder, who was seated on the lion throne, spotted his son from afar. He recognized him at once, but he told no one. He ordered his messenger instantly to hurry after his son and bring him back. The poor son shrieked in alarm and fainted on the ground. This person has seized me. Surely he will put me to death. Why, for the sake of food and clothing, am I here? The wealthy elder knew his son. Ignorant, foolish, and insular. Would never have believed his words. Let alone believed that he was his father. Instantly, he adopted the expedient methods. By ordering some men to talk to his son. A one-eyed man and a hideous lad. Both were completely wretched looking. You go tell him that. I will hire him. To remove excrement and filth. At double the usual wage. Having heard that, the poor son was thrilled to follow the men for the job of removing excrement and cleaning the mansion. The wealthy elder peered through the window panes to frequently observe his son. He knew his son, who was simple and humble, was fond of only the manual labor. Sometimes the wealthy elder put on soiled and ragged garments, brought along an excrement remover and went to his son's place. Through the expedient methods, he urged his son to work harder. I have increased your wages, and have given you oil balm to rub your feet. There is plenty of food and drink for you, as well as a warm duvet and thick bedding. Sometimes, he would reprove severely. You must work diligently. Sometimes, he would encourage him in a gentle voice. You are like my own son. The wealthy elder, a person of wisdom, gradually gave his son the freedom of entering and leaving the mansion. After twenty years had passed, he arranged for his son to get involved in his family business, showing him gold, silver, pearls, lapis lazuli, and the process of managing the treasures, so that his son could learn the tricks of the trade. However, he continued staying outside the gate, living in the thatched shack, perceiving himself as lowly and modest. He thought, none of these are mine. 
the father knew that the capacity of his son had gradually grown and expanded. Wishing to entrust his treasures to his son, he immediately gathered his relatives, kings and ministers, ksatriyas and other citizens. In the presence of the great congregation, he pronounced, He is my son. For fifty years, he abandoned me and wandered around. Twenty years have passed. Since I found my son, long ago, in such and such city, I lost my son. Combing everywhere in search of him to no avail. I arrived here and settled down. All my possessions, the mansion and the ordinary citizen, I will bequeath all to him. And he is free to do as he deems fit. The son reflected on his former poverty, his lowly aspiration, and his humility. Now that he had received from his father a great abundance of rare treasures, properties, and the mansion, as well as the rest of the other possessions, he was exhilarated at gaining something unprecedented. The Buddha is also as such. Knowing our fondness in the lesser Dharma, he never told us, You can become a Buddha. Instead, he expounded how we could become impeccable by practicing the lesser vehicle. As Shravaka disciples, the Buddha then expounded to us the foremost teaching If you practice this Dharma, you will definitely attain Buddhahood. We received the teaching of the Buddha who applied various causal explanations, parables, metaphors, and similes, as well as a melange of linguistic expressions, to expound the unsurpassed way. For the sake of Mahasattvas, when the children of the Buddha heard the Dharma from us, day and night, they contemplated and practiced the way earnestly. Thereafter, the Buddha immediately bestowed the prediction. In future existence, you will become a Buddha, the secret storehouse of the Dharma, of all Buddhas, was specifically expounded. For the sake of the Bodhisattvas, we presumed the true essence of teaching, was not expounded to us, Shravakas. This was the same as the poor son, despite his proximity to his father and his knowledge of the treasures. He did not covet the ownership of them. Thus we say, although the Buddha had preached the treasure storehouses of the Buddha Dharma, we did not have the aspiration to seek it. This explains the key essence of the parable. Striving to purify ourselves. We presumed that was enough. Only this did we have the understanding of. Let alone anything else. Although we heard the vision of the pure Buddha land, the teaching and transforming of all living beings, we did not feel jubilant. Why is this so? Because the Dharma of reality is ultimately tranquil and empty. There is no creation, no destruction, no large, no small, no imperfection, and no action. Because of this contemplation, we do not feel joy or jubilation. Throughout the long night, with regard to the Buddha wisdom, we have no greed, no attachment, no desire, and no aspiration. We presumed that the Dharma we knew was already the ultimate. Throughout the long night, we practiced the Dharma of emptiness, so as to liberate from the threefold world and the bitter pains of trials and tribulations, dwelling in the final existence. We expected to attain the partial nirvana. Due to the teaching of the Buddha, we attained the way that was not in vain. In having done so, we had already repaid our gratitude to the Buddha. Although we had expounded the teachings of the Bodhisattvas for all children of the Buddha, so as to lead them in attaining the Buddha way. Yet we ourselves had never desired or felt delighted in such teaching. Having seen this, the teacher let us be. For he knew our minds. 
he did not encourage us initially. Or even speak of the actual benefits. Just like the wealthy elder. Knowing the humble outlook of his son. Chose to use the power of expedient methods. To gently develop the mind of his son. This paved the way for him to eventually entrust. All his treasures and fortune to his son. The same goes for the Buddha. Knowing those who are contented with the inferior doctrines. He uses the power of expedient methods. An exceptionally unusual way. To develop their minds within. So that he can later teach them the great wisdom. Today, we have gained. An unprecedented experience. Something we had never previously desired. Has now come to us on its own accord. We are like the poor sons. Who receive immeasurable treasures. O Bhagavat. We have now attained the way. Received the fruit of the impeccable Dharma. And gained the pure eyes. Throughout the long night. We observed the pure precepts of the Buddha. Today, for the first time. We achieve the results. Under the Dharma of the Dharma King. We have been practicing the Brahma way. Now, we have attained the state of perfection. And received the unsurpassed great fruit. Now, we have become. Bona fide shravakas. Through the Buddha voice. We can lead all living beings to hear the Dharma. Now, we have become. Bona fide arhats. We deserve worship. From all beings in the realm of. Heaven, human, demons, and the Brahma. As well as those dwelling within the worlds. O Bhagavath. The great benefactor. With his abundant mercy. He teaches and transforms us with compassion. So as to benefit all of us through an unusual means. For immeasurable billions of kulpas. Who could ever repay the gratitude to him? Though we should offer our limbs and legs. Or bow our heads in reverence. Or give all kinds of offerings. Though we should lift up using the crowns of our heads. Or bear him on both our shoulders. And revere him with all our hearts. For innumerable kulpas. None of us would be able to fully repay him. Though we should offer sumptuous cuisines. Immeasurable jeweled apparels. Various articles of bedding. An array of potions or medicines. Though we should use oxen head sandalwood. A hoard of precious treasures. To build pagodas or temples. And cover the ground with jeweled apparels. Though we should give. All the above mentioned. For as innumerable kulpas as the Ganges's sands. Still, none of us would be able to repay him. All Buddhas have. Immeasurably boundless. And inconceivably mighty power. Of the divine, the transcendental. Dharmaless and effortless. He is the king of the Dharma. For the sake of the lowly and humble ones. He demonstrates forbearance. For the common mortals, obsessed with external forms. He applies various methodologies to teach. The Buddhas have. The greatest freedom to teach the Dharma. Because the Buddha understands the various. Desires, pleasures, and aspirations of all living beings. He adapts his teaching styles according to. The personality and preference of each individual. He expounds the Dharma. Through countless parables and metaphors. So as to suit the capacities of all living beings. This is because the Buddha understands. Whether the virtuous roots cultivated from previous existences. Have reached maturity. Or are far from reaching maturity. The Buddha applies a host of considerations. Differentiations and perceptions. To flexibly expound the one vehicle as three. As appropriate to individuals or situations.